thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. My name is Jean-Paulo Bayaki. I am a, an associate professor here at NYU. And I'm the director of the Urban Democracy Lab, which is a research, and, a research collaborative out of the Gallatin School that is focused on social justice urbanism. Uh, before I thank you and thank our speakers for coming out to celebrate this very nice book tonight, before I forget, let me announce that we have one more event coming up on November 6th at 1230 in this space, uh, which is a celebration uh, with, of the book, City is a Factory. Uh, it'll be a conversation with some of the editors and authors uh, of that book. Anyways, we're out here tonight to celebrate, discuss, um, and have questions to the editors and authors of this very nice book, Deconstructing the High Line, by Christoph Lindner and Brian Rosa. Uh, Christoph Linder is professor and dean of the College of Design at the University of Oregon and an honorary research professor in cultural analysis at the University of Amsterdam. He's an interdisciplinary urban and cultural theorist whose work addresses the interrelations between cities, globalizations, and visual culture. His recent books include the one, one that I think is very nice, The Imagining New York City, uh, as well as edited volumes, Global Garbage, City Interrupted in the Paris Amsterdam Underground. He is director of the newly launched Slow Lab, a research initiative at Oregon's College of Design promoting the critical inquiry into the global culture of speed, mobility, and connectivity. I was going to make a joke about the slow lab competing with the urban democracy lab, but I said we were faster. <laughs> um, on that side of the table is Brian Rosa. He's assistant professor of urban studies at Queens College and of geography at the CUNY Graduate Center. His research focuses on the transformation of post-industrial urban districts, the political economy of urban heritage and preservation, spaces of urban transportation infrastructure, and more broadly, the spatial and cultural politics of urban transformation in Britain, the United States, and Spain. He is co-editor of uh, Deconstructing Highline, and is currently working on a book entitled The City Below, Spaces of Infrastructure in the Post-Industrial Imaginary, which is based on research in Manchester and London. And at the middle uh, is Julie Rothenberg. She's associate professor of sociology at CUNY Queensborough Community College, where she teaches courses in urban sociology, sociology of the arts, and intro -soch. She has written and spoken on aesthetics and social theory, art worlds in urban space, and gentrification in post-industrial urban development. She is currently researching development along abandoned railroad infrastructure in Western Queens in light of the contradictions exposed by the High Line effect. And she is also studying the creative placemaking strategies deployed by University of Chicago and the Gates Rebuild Foundation and their efforts to develop neighborhoods in the south side of Chicago's historic black, black, historic black belt. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, and the format, for those of you who are familiar, we are going to let the panel self-moderate and self-police. Uh, and they've allotted themselves 10 minutes per speaker. And then we will open up, and that will allow us plenty of time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you for coming along. And thank you so much for the introduction and for hosting us here at the Urban Democracy Lab. Um, I thought I would share with you a little bit what we want to try and achieve in the first 30 minutes or so of the evening before we open the gates to questions, discussion, and whatever follows from there. And what we do not want to do is simply uh, relate information contained in the book. What we'd like to try to do is go a little bit beyond the book. And that's why we've titled the evening After Effects of the High Line. So it's, in a way, the afterlife of this book. Where does it lead? What new ideas come out of it? but also uh, trying to think um, beyond the simple structure of the High Line. So each of us has a few things we want to share coming from our own individual perspectives. They're not going to add up to a cohesive whole, that's not the idea, but rather um, just float some ideas, some perspectives um, out there. We're going to try and be a little bit provocative. We want to stimulate discussions. We want you to, to have things to ask us or even accuse us of. Um, and uh, that's, that's our approach. And before we get into that, though, I, I just want to say one or two things about the uh, genesis of this book. Um, the title is not a celebration of uh, Derrida and, and, and postmodern philosophy, deconstructing the High Line. It, it's actually something quite different. Um, a number of years ago, Brian and I were sitting in the grass in Paris enjoying a baguette sandwich. And it turns out we have both recently been to the High Line and we both enjoyed our visit. But then we also noticed that all of the public and academic discussion surrounding this project was incredibly celebratory. And we thought there must be a darker side to this project. 
And the book emerged from our desire to gather a group of academics from a whole range of different disciplines to critically engage with the High Line. And that doesn't mean always being negative, but to engage with the High Line as a site of uh, um, um, social, economic, cultural, political problems, as well as design and architecture issues. So that's the genesis of the book, is to bring together uh, a, a group of people to be difficult with the High Line and to ask difficult questions about its effects on the neighborhood, on the city, and as we'll hear more about tonight, uh, other locations worldwide. But what I'd like to share with you just in the, in, the, in the few minutes I have is a little bit of my own contribution to this volume and the way that, just from my own perspective, I've tended to approach this subject. And um, I float the idea of retro walking. For me, this is what the High Line encapsulates, a particular kind of social spatial practice that is um, about returning and repeating and nostalgia. And I'll try to illustrate a little bit what I mean by that. I like to share this image, a rendering from before the High Line was ever constructed. And this is one of a series of images that was designed to create a public interest and appetite for the project. And I like it because, to me, it looks like an undead promenade, a zombie scape. Atomized, individual, lonely people walking, all with their backs turned to us through the darkness at night. It could be a production still out of The Walking Dead. And that works for the argument that I make um, in my own chapter, which is that I see the High Line as a deliberate site of slow practice, of slowness. It's a space that's designed to resuscitate the faded bourgeois 19th century practice of the urban promenade and retool it and recalibrate it in the larger landscape and context of the 21st century global city. And it does that by promoting slowness. And to me, this image, and it's one that features in the book, um, is particularly fascinating because it includes a photograph of the High Line from uh, Joel Sternfeld from before the project alongside the completed project. And I, looking at this, I had to ask myself, well, why place it there? And there are many reasons to place it there. But one of them, I think, is it's partly instructional. What is that image doing there? It's serving as a reminder to those who are slowly walking by about the history and heritage of this space. And it's encouraging, I think, visitors to experience the High Line as a nostalgic memory walk, to be conscious of the fact that you're strolling along these reanimated, revivified urban ruins. But as many people have, have, have talked about in recent years, and this is what kind of gets us into the topic of this evening, what I find particularly fascinating about the site is the effect on the surrounding cityscape. The fact that the popularity and success in terms of visitor numbers, uh, investment, and this kind of stuff has had a peculiar effect, which is that uh, the High Line is producing its own view. And the more successful that view, the more it produces. So you have buildings being built because of their proximity to the park. So you can look down on the park. And at the same time, that makes the park an even more interesting destination because you have a view to look at that's constantly evolving and developing, and more and more, including a lot of signature buildings by architects. And so this has led to a phenomenon that a number of scholars have been talking about over the last decade, super gentrification. In fact, people are trying to go beyond this now. Apparently, super gentrification is not the latest thing, hyper gentrification. <laughs> And I'm not sure where we go beyond that. But I think it's fair to say that what we've seen in the High Line, and there are versions of this elsewhere in New York, such as in Brooklyn Heights, is the phenomenon of super gentrification, which is a hype-driven process, mainly tied to real estate, um, in which already gentrified neighborhoods are re-gentrified. So it is now the super rich displacing the rich who have displaced the rest. And that's a peculiar kind of uh, a phenomenon that peculiar, creates a peculiar kind of tension. And I just want to end before handing the mic over to Julia with this image, a rendering um, of uh, Zaha Hadid's uh, very expensive, very refined luxury condos overlooking the High Line. 
I believe the, the price tag of these condos starts at around $22 million. And it envisions the, uh, uh, the high-rise development of the Hudson Yards mega project. And the reason I think this rendering is worth spending a little bit of time looking at is because of the future that it imagines. I would describe all of this as a kind of hysteria. Um, aesthetically, architecturally speaking, I think we're into the realm of narcissistic urbanism and design delirium. And what I mean by that, if you look at these buildings, that all that's really left are these kinds of almost vanity projects staring at each other. And the High Line itself becomes lost, miniaturized, a small little strip of green at the bottom, no longer the focus, but instead the kind of um, um, leftover object. So that's something that I wanted to share. Um, I will pass the mic on to Julia, who will say a few words about different ideas. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Brian and Christoph for inviting me to join this panel. I am not an author in their book, so we kind of started our conversation after the publication of the book. And it ended up that a lot of the things that I had been working on vis-a-vis -vis the Highline intersected. and. Um, and uh, had resonance uh, us with them, so uh, or me with them. Um, so thank you for enjoy inviting me to join the panel. I think that many of us claimed, or at least suspected, when we began studying the development of the abandoned tracks in West Chelsea, that this project would come to represent a kind of ideal type of post-industrial urban reuse and branding strategy. And based on the plethora of copycat projects, some of which um, Brian will discuss. Uh, indeed, um, those predictions were prescient. And many of us also, especially those of us prone to a more critical analysis of neoliberal urban urbanization process, it, processes in general, also foresaw the contradictions inherent in legitimating discourses and claims deployed by Highline boosters who sold the project based on appeals to both economic growth and to a notion of public good. As I've argued in my own work, the discourses through which support for the High Line was framed initially appeared to reconcile the inherent contradictions between the growth machine's logic of capital accum accumulation and the public space needs of the community. Today, it seems obvious, even to former executive director of Friends of the High Line, David Hammond, that the High Line has failed to foster equitable development in West Chelsea. According to Hammond, who recently convened the High Line Network, a grant-funded network consisting of urban parks projects that, quote, embrace the High Line ethos, seeing the beauty in some discarded piece of infrastructure and transforming it into a public space, according to Hammond, confronting social issues, gentrification, displacement, equitable development, all of those have been a very hot topic of discussion in the network. Um, it remains to be seen if any, if and what impact um, on the future collusion of capital and community-based placemaking projects the Highline effect will end up having. My current research involves a post-industrial reuse project on a derelict section of above-ground railroad and guerrilla garden called Smiling Hogshead Ranch, adjacent to the rails in Hunters Point, Queens. This project is in its nascent stages, and it provides us the opportunity to observe and speculate about an entire trajectory of development. The Smiling Hogshead and other key players subscribe to an idealistic, almost utopian vision of their activities. Sorry. Oh, did I not have that up there? Um, which draws on themes from environmental activism, the community garden movement, the anti-hierarchical organization of Occupy Wall Street, and the environmental and ecological art practices of the early 70s. They're also aware that utopian efforts to beautify and revitalize defunct, lighted, or underused urban space can and usually do act as contributing factors to gentrification and the attendant displacement of low-income urban dwellers and the light industries in which many of these urban residents are employed and businesses that um, they utilize. Indeed, these activists distance their vision from the Highline effect. In fact, they frame their project precisely against the glitzy Highline development, placing issues of social sustainability and resistance to gentrification at the forefront of their proposals. I'm just going to show you a couple of images of the site of the, the garden. And these are the, um, some of the gardeners up on the Montauk cutoff above their garden. Behind them is um, the Long Island City, which uh, I'm going to 
explain is actually um, emblematic of this hypergentrification phenomenon. Um, and these are beds of greenery. Um, so um, Smiling Hogshead is a collective of artists, activists, and gardeners who um, activated an abandoned urban greenfield adjacent to a defunct rail spur, the Montauk Cutoff, of the Long Island Railroad in the Hundreds Point neighborhood of Queens. The former, this former resident industrial business district borders sections of Long Island City that have seen rapid gentrification and luxury development in recent years. Smiling Hogshead began as a guerrilla garden in 2011, but subsequently partnered with the property's owner, the MTA, which agreed to provide them with a year-by-year -year lease. It's just more of Long Island City. Um, the original members of the Smiling Hogshead Collective worked in loose partnership with a number of other community-based nonprofit groups, including an artist collective and residency program called the Flux Factory, the Newtown Creek Alliance, dedicated to the restoration of Newtown Creek, a polluted estuary that forms part of the border between Brooklyn and Queens, and a land advocacy group called 596 Acres. These are just some images of Newtown Creek, which um, the Montauk Cutoff reaches over, in fact, um, and is a super fun site um, being cleaned up. Um, later, in response to an MTA request for expressions of interest, members of Smiling Hogs had joined with other community activists to form the Cutoff Coalition to work on a proposal, which they call Ranch on Rails, to save the 4.2-mile strip of abandoned elevated rail that borders the ranch. The key conviction of the Cutoff Coalition, according to their website, is that all New Yorkers should be able to access and enjoy our public spaces. And the Ranch on Rail strategy embodies an inclusive ethos. Um, the Cutoff Coalition is in the process of developing a proposal for the space, which will include an urban gardening and education initiative, a cooperative hub which will support and house workers' own cooperatives, local artists, nonprofit and nonprofits focused on community wealth building programs. The proposal for the space will also call for renewable energy sources including solar photovoltaic vertical axis wind turbines and energy generating kinetic furniture. It will utilize green infrastructure techniques including fungi and compost tea, bioremediation, I don't know what that is, um, constructed wetlands, native grass and flower species, and an on-site micromediation lab and migratory bird habitat. These are all taken from the <coughs> website. Um, so these are the, the um, illustrations of some of the plans, the renderings. None of this, none of this stuff has happened yet. Um, so, and as they say, the Ranch on Rails offers a unique opportunity to make a lasting contribution to the quality of life uh, in New York City. Um, and they have a couple of other um, um, things to say on various blogs and websites um, that are rather poetic. This is, a bu this is building the new world from the hollowed out shell of the old one. The shell might not be attractive, but you're going to like what grows from within. We at the ranch have ambitious plans for an urban agriculture model unlike any other that has been realized before. Please don't make us give up this dream of a transformative urban farm and a performative landscape rising out of the abandoned gray infrastructure of our revolutionary industrial past. Um, in order to evaluate whether their intention to avoid the High Line effect is anything more than a pipe dream, it's important to place the ranch on rails in the context of the development projects already taking place in the neighborhood and to compare this context against West Chelsea. Like in the case of the High Line, this projected development is taking place on an, in an area which is already in the throes of a hot market and rapid development. In fact, the North Long Island City area is already uh, is a model of hypergentrification, as I said. The area surrounding the ranch, with its history of light industry, is not zoned for residential development and lags behind its neighboring area in terms of development. But signs of gentrification are clear with new hotel developments, repurposed manufacturing buildings, now housing makers, nonprofits, and foodie retail, and the occasional gallery space. Am I done? Done? Okay. Um, so this is a hotel. Um, and this is uh, actually a, a design similar to um, to, to Jameson uh, development of Chelsea Market near the High Line. Um, the bottom line with the High Line is that the bottom line with the High Line was that 
for in order for the High Line to realize their dreams of preserving the tracks and reinvigorating the space, they had to first sell their idea to the city and local property owners. They did this with the aid of a zoning mechanism called transfer of air rights, by which property owners profit from the sales of land under the High Line in a hot market that would otherwise be com compromised by the existence of the structure. To agree to save the High Line, these property owners needed an alternative way to monetize their investment, and this came in the form of air rights. Um, in order to get the city to implement these new zoning regulations, Friends of the High Line had to demonstrate that the High Line had potential to bring tourist dollars and tax revenues for the city. They also enlisted and capitalized on the pro uh, park's proximity to the arts district and other art world actors, in part by drawing on the aesthetics of the wild post-industrial ruin, which had resonance with the art world zeitgeist and popular urban romanticism of the creative class. Finally, they were able to link the Highline through design factors with high-end consumption um, of the area and the spectacular experience above. But in the final analysis, they, um, it was conceived as an economic development strategy, the Highline, and the deal was made very early on with the urban growth machine. Um, it couldn't have been saved if it hadn't justified its development in concert with the logic of economic development. In the case of Smiling Hogshead and Cutoff Coalition, the land has already been saved. MTA gave it to them. But they still need to come up with concrete plans and a scheme for funding. The land directly adjacent to the garden and the cutoff is currently underutilized, but it's starting to be populated with hotels catering to anti-tourist tourism, that is, tourists who wish to return home, having had a more authentic experience of their destination, and the maker and boutique workshops for light industry and warehouse spaces retooled as hip office spaces for startups, nonprofits, yoga studios, galleries, and so forth. Um, it's not like the speed and density of Chelsea gentrification, but something is certainly happening. Um, and it's likely that if, if, um, if the ranch on rails ends up, you know, if they do want to go forward with their development plans, they're going to have to partner with developers like Fauci, who developed the factory that we just saw, and others, um, who will soon, if they haven't already, recognize that the cutoff, the ranch, and indeed the now polluted canals and estuaries of Newtown Creek and Dutch, Dutch Kills had significant potential to raise the symbolic and monetary value of their property. We'll have to see how the utopian goals and community aspirations of the Smiling Hogshead Collective are eventually reconciled with the real politics of neoliberalism liberal urban development. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Brian Rosa. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, looking at the High Line effect uh, in Britain. Um, diachronically, first, at some sort of uh, some of the preceding infrastructural reuse projects in Manchester, England, that I looked at in my doctoral research. And then some of the ways that the High Line has influenced a variety of design and redevelopment initiatives in British cities. Um, this relates to some of the research I'm currently conducting for a book entitled City Below. And I hope this will shed some light on the genealogy of the High Line, some of its global repercussions, and how the High Line has gradually become less of a distinctive site than a sort of typology of infrastructural reuse project. So firstly, I would like to note that there has been a long fixation on the residual spaces of urban infrastructures within the design fields. So we're talking uh, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design. The desire to rationalize and design leftover or indeterminate spaces produced by urban infrastructures, uh, whether they're still functioning or abandoned, can really be traced back at least to the work of Kevin Lynch since the 1960s. And we could even look back further to 19th century improvement projects. Uh, and of course, due to the historic development patterns in North America and Europe, it's often difficult to differentiate between infrastructural and industrial or post-industrial urban landscapes. They're quite often one in the same. And um, as you know, many of which have experienced long periods of disinvestment and are now hotbeds of property speculation. So I would argue that these residual spaces of infrastructure, these leftover spaces along and beneath different types of urban and transport infrastructures, um, have become among the primary concerns of the fields of urbanism. Uh, and the example of High Line is really at its core as a tried and tested tool of property revalorization through the creation of new landscapes and parks. So 
first of all, the, there's a question of what is the high line effect. And um, we can define it in a number of different ways, but the self-description of the high line network gives us some ideas. Just a few examples here of some of the publications which have come out recently within the uh, architecture field, specifically an urban design field, specifically focused upon how do we treat these spaces left over beneath and alongside infrastructures to create new landscapes of often leisure and consumption. Uh, one of which in New York under the elevated uh, program uh, between the Design Trust for Public Space and the New York Department of Transportation to look at the spaces beneath the elevated subways in New York. So we have the emergence uh, in the past year of, a, of something called the High Line Network, um, which is a network of 19 urban park projects in the US and Canada, coordinated by Friends of the High Line. And um, taking from their own text, if we want to think about what the High Line effect might be, uh, it would be the focus on the reclaimed, underutilized infrastructure and reimagining of it as public space, or alternatively, transforming underutilized infrastructure into new urban landscapes. So it's very clearly something about using design as an approach to address sites of either disused infrastructure or landscapes or uh, abandoned infrastructure. But if we go back a little bit at the genealogy of these sort of projects involving infrastructural reuse and post-industrial aestheticization, um, I think we can actually see some of this first emerging in, uh, in Manchester, England. Um, this from the 1945 Manchester City Plan, uh, written during World War II, in which these elevated railways were perceived as unnecessarily ugly and dreary structures. At the same, within a decade of that, we have a parade celebrating the uh, dismantling of the last of the elevated railways in New York City. So this is the Third Avenue L, 1955, a parade celebrating its dismantling. This is the last of the above ground subways in Manhattan. So what happened in the half a century between parade celebrating the uh, dismantling of these sort of structures and the adaptive reuse of uh, abandoned freight line like the High Line. One case, if we go back historically, was, uh, was Castlefield. So this area, which was the site of crisscrossing canals and railways, which really drove the Industrial Revolution in Manchester, um, was part of a concerted effort uh, run by the uh, Central Manchester Development Corporation, a public-private partnership, using property-led development to create walkways and areas for leisure, consumption, and a sort of uh, heritage tourism in an area that was called an urban heritage park. This is actually the first such park in Britain. So we're talking about the 1980s here. Very much focused on the aestheticization of these viaducts themselves. What this also meant was that it was a focus upon widespread industrial displacement of the remaining light industrial uses that were happening along and beneath these railways. So to create this post-industrial leisure space requires the displacement of whatever remaining industrial use there is. We have the end result of Castlefield today. After the industrial uses have been pushed out from the ground level, we gradually see the reinsertion of cafe bars and uh, more broadly, I would say conspicuous consumption. At the same time, we see the sandblasting and floodlighting of these, of these viaducts, this sort of monumentalization of structures that were very much associated with utilitarian uh, transport-based usage. Of course, we had the Promenade Plante in Paris, the precursor to the High Line, 
inaugurated in 1993, we can actually see that that was constructed atop a very similar type of brick viaduct to what we had in Manchester. And we have this monument monumentalization process, right? We, we have the treatment of these structures, which usually weren't held up at the same regard as infrastructure in the symbolic economy of the city, to all of a sudden be something to be celebrated, to be preserved, which comes with its own contradictions. And I will leave it just on a couple of projects that I've been observing and researching in London. Um, We can find numerous examples of Highline inspired design led projects in British cities, some slowly coming to fruition, others ultimately failing. In Britain, like other parts of the world, the Highline has begun to signify a typology of residual infrastructural space, a design approach, and a method for revalorization of these sites. It's not even the case so often that projects are described as being inspired by the Highline so much as being called Highlines. Uh, it's no longer a proper noun. So here from a recent piece in The Guardian, five Highline parks created from abandoned transport, infra transport routes in pictures. We have the Peckham Coal Line, um, a project which would be considered more community-based and at least um, rhetorically interested in trying to prevent widespread displacement and having a more community-involved design process. We have another site in Manchester in which an abandoned viaduct might become a sort of hanging gardens. And we have a major project along the sort of Bankside and London Bridge area of, uh, of the south of the River Thames in London called the Low Line. So New York has a low line, uh, London has a low line too. Um, what's interesting here is at this point we see that a lot of these projects, if they might be initiated by some sort of speculative design process, they just as well might be initiated by a consortium of property developers and business improvement districts, which is more or less the case when we're looking at the low line. So no longer is it even imagined so much as a sort of ground up community based process as building upon the success of projects like the High Line to revalorize property, to bring in more high rent uses into the railway arches. And this is part of a much broader and more widespread process of um, commercial gentrification and displacement in London. We have in Leeds here their own High Line project with new high-rise luxury housing being built next to it, a very direct sort of reverberation with what's happening in New York. And the last thing I wanted to note was the London Garden Bridge project, um, because maybe this might help us think about the limits to this sort of design-led infrastructural urban nature approach to redevelopment. So the Garden Bridge, designed by Thomas Heatherwick, uh, who was also uh, to be the designer of the failed Pier 55 uh, in, in New York City. This project was ultimately uh, shut down after 37 million pounds of public funds being invested into it. It was a semi-privatized park that was meant to create another connection between the north and the south banks of the River Thames. And this was largely because Sadiq Khan, the current mayor, eventually bowed to pressure from a number of activists that this was ultimately public fund driven uh, process which would predominantly serve to benefit private property interests and it was not truly a public space. Uh, should probably leave it there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so those were some ideas we wanted to share with you, but really most of our time here is open for us to have uh, a group discussion. So we hope to have uh, stimulated uh, some ideas on your part. Anything that you would like to ask us or each other, uh, the floor is open. And listening to um, our presentations, it occurs to me that something we're all asking in our own ways is what can we learn from the High Line? 
I wouldn't say that the phenomenon has, is, is yet complete. There's still unfolding dimensions, both of the project and what surrounds it. But we've been living with the High Line long enough, and particularly for those uh, uh, of us or for you who live in New York, uh, long enough to, to have a sense of, what it, of how it has transformed parts of the city. Um, and so what can we learn? And do we want to learn? And to what extent do we follow a cut and paste approach in other communities and spaces? Or as the examples that Julio was sharing, do we try to develop genuine alternatives to the High Line that similarly embrace the adaptive reuse of urban infrastructure, but that actually try to build in an inclusive urbanism um, that we haven't seen in the High Line? So anyway, the floor is open. Um, please, questions, ideas, comments? Um, yeah, why don't we, we have an extra mic here. Why don't we just kind of circulate this around the room? It's kind of a stupid chicken and egg question. Um, but uh, the hyper gentrification and the high line, mm -hmm. is, uh, are the two somewhat, somewhat inevitably linked? Is there a possibility that one follows the other in, in a kind of a predictable pattern? Is it possible to have something like the high line without gentrification following it and or vice versa? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think, Brian, I know that you at least know more about this than I do, but, but I would say that absolutely they're, they're linked. And that was part of the whole point of the Highly. Once the city and some of the uh, uh, private investors got interested in supporting the project, it was absolutely tied to the idea that the park would unleash, unlock new rapid real estate development, property development around the park. So the point of the park was partly to make gentrification possible. Can you avoid it? That's a very different question. But in this case, that was part of the design. So just to add briefly to that, um, so the real crux, the real turning point when, when it came to actually seeing the High Line's realization was the West Chelsea rezoning. So. And, and this was this is intimated a bit in in the um, in the book produced by the uh, founders of the Friends of the High Line that there was a sort of question there of what is gained and what is lost by actually going along with the West Chelsea rezoning process. But the city would not have bought into the project otherwise. I don't I don't believe at least, um, and that was largely based upon the. Um, it's predicated, in fact, upon high-rise luxury development and what that would mean in terms of tax revenues for the city. Um, how do we prevent gentrification in such processes? Um, there's a lot of interesting policy discussions to be d to be considered about that. I think it really has to do with questions like uh, broadening a great deal rent stabilization, uh, expanding that potentially to commercial rather than just to residential properties and figuring out ways to um, have greater regulation of how the benefits of property development actually return to the citizens. Yeah. Are we able to circulate the mic? Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. And I think a lot of things stood out to me. I was really interested in seizing on this question of nostalgia that you raise. That theme is really interesting because it's counterintuitive, I think, since we think of the High Line and High Lines as futuristic constructions or objects. Um, but one of the things in my own thinking about the High Line, uh, I'm struck by the way its guardians seem to anticipate um, those types of things and absorb them or call attention to them. Some of my own, my own thinking and writing is about the art um, of the High Line. The, the on the nose example of the zombification effect that you're talking about is the sleepwalker, um, which was this sort of undead sleepwalking somnambulant figure on the High Line last year during the exhibit. Um, but I think the High Line network also is an anticipation of the, the critiques people have been making um, and mobilization against, against some of the critiques. So I guess, I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit, but my question is, is 
Um, what is the backlash you see against some of these critiques? And also, this, this idea of nostalgia, how do we reckon um, with, with the nostalgia that the Highline evokes while it's also kind of promoting itself as, as an innovation? Anyone want to jump in? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to say something about that. Um, that, I mean, nostalgia is one way of putting it, but uh, but I think that it's not so much that the Highline plays on nostalgia, but rather kind of aestheticizes these pieces of um, functional design, and and in so doing, kind of erases the actual human productive activity that that was taking place during the period of industrialization and after and, and in a sense kind of removes it from removes it from that kind of um, rich social history and I guess a related question to what you're asking is I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to and I'm wondering if, if some of the projects in Britain that, that Brian has studied because there's more of a kind of a sense of working class history as a, a thing which doesn't exist in the United States if even even the nostalgia for, for the working class past can be kind of monetized. I don't think that's what's happening in the case of the Highline because that's so erased in, from the American consciousness in a, in a way. Um, but I'm wondering if you could Let that. me jump in before I forget this because it's, okay. it's kind of already leaving my head. But, but when you were speaking, Julia, in response to the question, it made me think of the Highline as a sanitized ruin. So the way that it activates nostalgia is in a very safe, predictable, contained, easy to aestheticize and enjoy kind of experience. It's not a, 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 it's not a dangerous, provocative thing. It's a gentle, very gentle reminder about a history and a past and an architectural sort of heritage. But at the same time, and I don't know whether Anthony Vidler would, would agree with this, but probably a lot of you know his... Um, his concept of the architectural uncanny. And I think we could describe the High Line as a contemporary version of this architectural uncanny if we think of it as a space designed to um, render the familiar newly strange. And so in this case, it's that transport infrastructure reimagined as a park. But What's, to me, really the key thing is none of this is designed to provoke, to shock, to disorient, but rather to give you a highly curated, manicured, controlled experience um, um, that is about leisure and pleasure. It occurs to me, um, is it okay if I respond? Absolutely, but if you can grab the mic, that would be great. Well, it occurs to me that the High Line is this sort of exemplary, bygone, working class object, a post-industrial object that's lost its use. And then um, the project of the park is reabsorbing it for the information economy and making it adorable for, um, in, in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's in, you talk about it being sanitized. I think there's a way it um, generates amnesia about what's bygone in, yeah, in so American it's not, life. It, I, I agree. I, I, it's, not, it's not activating a history that you then think about, oh, what's the transport history of this space? And how did, what happened to the rail industry? And how did the arrival of cars and buses you know, kill off the, the trains? Um, it's not doing any of that. It's, it's, it's just a really um, gentle, simple way of, of making you feel good. You could think of it in another term as a, as a sort of palliative amnesia, right? I mean, and it also isn't activating, just let me respond to that really quickly, it's not activating any sense of what, um, what post-industrialization has wrought. And I just, I, you know, you mentioned the somnambulist, um, Sculpture, and I'm thinking also of the that frame, you know, that overlooks uh, on the 26th Street. That kind of like frame with, with behind it is um, housing projects, right? And so, but but interestingly, there is no indication for tourists passing by that, and and especially tourists who don't know anything about, and and most don't 
at least based on my research, public housing in the United States, um, what happened in the 1960s, uh, white flight and so forth, they don't, like there's this frame that's framing it, but it's not, it, it's not brought out in any way in the design of the Highland. So it, just to respond to what you said about the amnesia, it's interesting. I wanted to say one thing, or two things, in defense of the high lines that I haven't heard yet that this has brought about more of a consciousness of pedestrianizing public space. And that area was supposed to have major, you know, highways, and that has brought a lot of car-free area open to everybody all over the world with, with the various high lines. I also think of um, one of the models of the New York high line, um, the one in Paris, Promenade Pointe, which I don't think has that same um, surrounding area, maybe because a lot of it was already built and it um, environment and you overlook many beautiful um, buildings and possibly a lot of the high lines that are being built over unused space, that could be a major project of mixing um, commercial and housing, including affordable housing, which I don't think our mayor understands, um, that that could be one way of salvaging the space, pedestrianizing these old rails, and also not gentrifying. I live right near the High Line. I live mm -hmm. in, that, in West Chelsea. And I've seen a lot of change in the neighborhood, yeah. a lot of um, shops. My street was actually highlighted about two years ago in the Times how all of these little mom and pop stores are gone and now we have upscale uh, doggy, um, uh, doggy daycares and, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Doggy daycare. cupcake shops. And so there are a couple of things I wanted to uh, respond to. First of all, the question of pedestrian permeability. Um, in thinking of London, and actually the case of Manchester, it's quite interesting some of the tensions with the idea of making the city more walkable and permeable and the expansion of property development out from the traditional commercial core. Uh, actually in both, both places in the south of London and in the southern fringe of Manchester city center, permeability in terms of uh, opening up some of the arches so people could walk through trying to attract people to the other side of the, um, the railway viaduct for a very long time in both cities, this was considered to be some sort of city wall and a barrier between the commercial district and the industrial and working class district. And on one hand, this is justified uh, in terms of saying this will create more opportunities for people who work in these lower income areas to find work, for example. But it's also very much tied deliberately with the process of trying to expand high-end property development to the other side of this perceived barrier, so it's not a barrier anymore. And this is do done through pedestrianization. So it can end up being a double-edged sword if there aren't really adequate protections to affordable housing. I can tell you, if you're not familiar with what's happening in London, the city has been actively demolishing public housing projects at a very high rate in order to increase their tax revenue to fulfill the funding gaps that they're not receiving from the national government. Um, and going back br briefly to this idea of heritage and preservation and authenticity. So in Castlefield, the example I was looking at, um, it was very much initially imagined as, as I said, an urban heritage park. A lot of that was led through erasure um, of the actual existing industry there. But there were a lot of plaques. There was uh, tr trying to create some sort of sense of some authenticity, including having very little green space because there would not have been very much green space in Castlefield during the Industrial Revolution. This has gradually changed where they keep inserting more and more green walls, trying to put in this hanging garden, putting planters inside of the canals to create new ecosystems. And the notion of industrial heritage and authenticity, I'm not saying that this is the proper historical or design approach necessarily. We, we don't have as much of a sort of museumification as we did before as we do this sort of hodgepodge aesthetic of reuse and inserting of the, the new and the contemporary. Fascinating. Um, and I think your question about pedestrianization is, is a really interesting one. Um, and I certainly agree that it's good to pedestrianize spaces. And I, I, I would advocate 
as much pedestrianization as possible. But I think it's also kind of an, an, an easy target or an easy workaround to take places that aren't, don't necessarily functionally connect parts of the city that aren't actively used and say, well, we're not displacing any cars, we're not displacing any parking, we're not stopping any of the other, you know, any of the traffic. And so we can easily pedestrianize it. I would be much more interested in someone taking huge swaths at whole avenues of New York and saying, you know what, this belongs to foot traffic. Um, that to me would be a much bolder, but also more transformative approach. So you've had your hand up for, for a while. Uh, so let's go, you know, take a question yeah. here and then we'll I mean, move over. I'll try to express myself the best I can. As you can tell, my native language is not English, so... Uh, okay, I'm trying to speak uh, uh, pro uh, line. First of all, I believe that gentrification is something much more complex than something that can be caused by a public space. The High Line is a public space, it's not a museum. It doesn't have to celebrate, not to celebrate, but to teach about the history of that neighborhood. It can be evocative, in fact, it's over that uh, human industrial uh, artifact. And probably this is more important than a museum because there's many people that never enter a museum, but these people, they're working on the High Line and maybe they get the notion of what it is and they'll get curious about it, what it is. Uh, probably what caused the um, gentrification of that area, uh, the prices going high, it's more the, uh, all the art galleries, the economical uh, aspects of that neighborhood. The High Line is a public space. Public space is a place where everything can happen. I can kiss my girlfriend, somebody can kill each other, somebody else uh, uh, can read a book. It's not a controlled space. This is a controlled space. Downstairs there's a guy asking everybody, where are you going? That's not a public space. Public space is not gentrification. Probably it's the opposite of gentrification. That's my point of view. It's not really a question. It's something more to yeah. no, thank talk you. about. I, mean, I think that's a really provocative way of articulating um, those views. And there's a couple of things, I imagine all of us will have something to say in response. So thank you. Yes. Um, but there's a couple of things I would say. First of all, um, I would disagree with the s s label of the High Line as a public space. I think that what we're seeing all over the world are more and more spaces that have the appearance but not the substance of publicness. And what enables those spaces to exist is also sometimes not very public. And something I learned a lot about in the book by some of the other authors and the chapters they wrote about the parks equity issues in New York City is an also an interesting thing in the sense that when public funds together with private uh, uh, sponsorship um, is concentrated in one part of the city, it means that sometimes attention is not being paid to other parts in the city. So even though we might agree that the High Line is a very beautiful space that does attract a lot of millions of people, we can also say that that level of attention and investment has meant other parks in New York, which still have much more of a public identity and are still used in a much more community-driven way, aren't getting the support that they need. So help for the High Line can sometimes hurt other parts of the city. But the second thing I'd like to say in response is that um, the High Line is just a small part of a much larger problem facing most of the world's large cities, which is the fact that people can't afford to live there increasingly. Too many cities, and this is the case in the US and places like New York, London, Los Angeles, it's just not possible for so, so many people to even exist there. And, um, you know, London is, is really, really struggling that, with this at the moment. Um, San Francisco is off the charts and out of control. And I think a lot of smaller cities, places like Portland, um, where, where I've spent a lot of time recently, are looking to this and thinking, you know, how, how can we avoid this? How, how can we make our, our city attractive, desirable to tourists, to business, to visitors, um, um, but also inclusive and affordable? 
And I think that's the general trend we're seeing in the world's large global cities, particularly in the West, is they are ex exclusive and unaffordable. So a um, couple points quickly. Uh, so the, an, the, I have a number of students here from my MA class uh, in urban infrastructure from CUNY Urban Studies. So hi, guys. Um, and it was students at CUNY who really helped me think in a particular way about how we perceive improvements like the insertion of new parks, for example. Basically, that um, if we can acknowledge that property development is quite intensive at this city, that gentrification is rampant, and people are very often being displaced from places they've lived, and we know that there is a close relationship between public space and gentrification, certainly not the same thing, that it's quite often the case that any sort of improvements made to someone's neighborhood are ultimately not going to be enjoyed by the people who had lived there previously, particularly if they're renters. Some homeowners might do quite well off of it, but generally not renters. Um, so it creates this almost sort of position we find ourselves in, which is slight, almost feels slightly misanthropic. Uh, resisting things like pedestrianization, resisting things like the provision of public space because we realize with lack of regulation of development that the ultimate conclusion is going to be widespread gentrification. And if that is the case, then there is actually some sort of resistance among residents to actually having some of these sort of improvements. There's, there's a sort of debate in geography about the idea of being just green enough. How do we make a neighborhood more ecological without taking it to the extent where it's likely to stimulate property values further. Um, and I, I would also note that, yes, the, there, was also, there was already a lot of gentrification going on in Chelsea. It was one of the centers of the, world's, the art world. Um, but ultimately, directly related to the creation of the High Line, a lot of these galleries have actually been displaced, um, many of them going to Chinatown. So, when we think about displacement, we can't just think of, about the traditional ideas of gentrification around residential usage. Displacement happens at the commercial level, too, and it's actually part of the same process and the same conversation. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your presentations. And I haven't read the book, so per, and I am very much looking forward to that. And I just want to give a little backstory to the High Line as someone who lives just a couple houses away from the High Line. I was actually instrumental in fighting against the High Line, not the High Line per se, I'm not opposed to the High Line, but the way they came into the community. They did it in a very, well, sh to use, it, it was rather deceitful. They did it during the summer, they didn't present it properly. They actually intended to tax my neighborhood in a one block radius. And so I took some time off from my dissertation. My professor called it a displacement activity, but we were <laughs> successful. So I collected signatures in the entire neighborhood. And I can't begin to tell you how the neighborhood feels about the High Line. And at that point, we didn't even know what it was going to do to us. And I think it's not only super gentrification, it's not only hyper gentrification. It is, I don't have a word for that yet, but if you look at how many Chinese LLC and other LLCs are parking their money along 10th Avenue, then, and they don't participate in, we have a very active community, of course, they don't participate in it. The buildings are dark at night. And um, so partially the High Line has not been a very good neighbor to us. Our property taxes have shut up. And uh, lots of my deli has been re at, at displaced. I mean, when one talks about displacement, it just remains kind of an abstract word and uh, it's actually, I feel it myself. I personally haven't been displaced because I was lucky enough to buy many, many, like over 22 years ago, and I've seen this neighborhood go from what it used to be with, uh, you know, with lots of drug problems and derelict buildings to what it is now. But I also think that it has gone now a little bit too far. 
I call it a vertical, a horizontal empire state building because, for example, I'm responsible for picking up the garbage in front of my house, you know, six inches into the street. So it has become a quality of life issue for us. At the, the projects where many of my friends live, they can barely buy food if it weren't for Western beef. They couldn't afford the food anymore in our own neighborhood. The High Line has said they would hire people from the project. It's been a huge fight. We actually had to really fight for them to live up to their work. And then, you know, they came a little bit along with that. They also, when they wanted to, to, to tax us within this one block radius, the New York Times and the New York Post, they actually did quite a bit of research and found out that Robert Hammond, one of the, one of the founders, mm -hmm. you know, they were uh, maybe double dipping is too big a word, but when you start uh, taxing people that can barely afford to live there and you have a consulting company, you know, taking money from the high line and getting a salary, then, you know, I guess that's double dipping and they exposed him. And uh, so there is like a lot of a lot of items, and I'm probably forgetting a tremendous amount. If, you know, I was quoted in one of the newspapers that when we when they wanted to tax us, that I want to choose to whom I want to give my money. <coughs> Maybe I want to give it to the soup kitchen on Eighth Avenue and not to too artfully designed grass. I do I enjoy the High Line. I go very, very rarely on it because when you were talking about the pedestrianization, this is beyond pedestrianization. You can't even walk on the High Line anymore. I mean, it's like, have you ever gone on the weekend? It, it is not enjoyable for the H neighborhood. Human traffic jams. Oh, it, yeah. it's, it, it's unbelievable. So my question is, in any of the articles in the book, and as I said, I haven't read it, and I found out from my friend Maria today that this was happening, and I actually, um, I decided not to go to our community meeting tonight, so I could come and perhaps supplement, you know, what mm -hmm. very often remains academic. This is not a, a reproach. I'm an academic myself, but I thought it would probably help to give a little bit of the backstory. And the other thing is when they were doing the tax the, the, the taxation issue. Well, I do think it's important to give to give some background because you know I understand, and if you want me to stop, I will. So it, 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 it's that they were doing it during the summer when all the galleries were, you know, they, were, they had summer recession. And, they, and then we, did, we built a, a, a website in order to, to, you know, kind of, you know, fight against them. And then precisely, the, and we, got, we, we lined up basically almost all the galleries. And so they weren't also, in, they weren't for it. So when, when we were doing that, the day before we were going, it was actually the Marlboro Gallery who paid for the, for, the, for, the, for the website. The day before we were going live, they withdrew the taxation issue, which, which Blomberg was for it, and of course Amanda Burden was for it. And then Amanda Burden said, oh, these people in Chelsea, they always fight so much, you know. And uh, so it, there, there, there are a tremendous amount of issues. So my question is, did any of the articles in the book canvas the neighborhood? Ask any of the of the of the residents how they have perceived the High Line, what has it done to their lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are there any figures in terms of displacement yeah. and uh, some statistical stuff that you know aside from you know all these other yeah. things that you were talking yeah, about? Yeah. So um, I mean, it's nice that you keep asking what's in the book because we have a whole pile of the <laughs> books out there, so everybody can find out for themselves. But. Um, um, but, um, um, you know, the book is limited. The book is basically, first of all, it's, a, it's mostly an academic book, but we tried to write things in a way that also would be interesting and engaging for a more diverse public. Um, and it's a book that we had to mobilize quite quickly. We had to bring together scholars from a lot of areas to try and address the topic. And in the process, there are uh, blind spots and things that, you know, didn't get included. Um, and my hope is that um, it will open up further research and further inquiry. So the book does not have, a, I, I think one of the things that, that we could have added, in retrospect, is more anthropological work and ethnographic field work around the High Line. That's not in there. Um, and with 
had we done that, I think we would have captured more of the narratives, the stories, the experience of the sort that you're describing. But where those experiences lead, the effects of that on the neighborhood, that is stuff that we do address. Uh, yeah, I just want to respond quickly. I, I actually also live near the High Line. And um, my, my research, which isn't in the book, but some of it, um, I do do some ethnographic uh, field work, m more talking to people um, who live in the housing projects that are, and this is something most people don't actually, re the thing about Chelsea is it is a mixed income neighborhood despite the the intense gentrification there is also two very large public housing projects which because we do have you know laws in in New York City for now that that protect the residents of these um, these buildings it it there are pockets of low income and there's also a very large uh, middle income housing development in West Chelsea called Penn South which is Kind of on the the model of Michelama, you know, limited equity. It's a it's a middle income housing project, more or less. So so we do have a kind of a um, it is a mixed income neighborhood in a sense. And one of the things that interested me as the High Line, you know, opened first opened in 2009, then I followed it for a number of years afterwards. Really was that from the from the very beginning, residents of the public housing which. Actually, they're underneath and abutting the High Line. Didn't use it much. And there was a sort of, and this kind of goes to what you were saying about public space. And you said that public space, it, it is a public space, and anyone can use it, and you can do what you want there. And in fact, that's not the sense that lower income residents of the community felt. Um, and that's something to interrogate, to think about what are the elements that, that contributed to to their feeling of exclusion from that space. Um, and, but, but in fact, you know, many of them didn't feel welcome, didn't feel included, and that's part of what Friends of the High Line, when they began to sort of do more community outreach and hired a, some, a new person to kind of do community-based programming and try and get, it was kind of a bad, um, it was bad visuals that the High Line, the people who used the High Line at least appeared so uniformly tourist, Caucasian, middle class. Um, and so they, you know, they, they expended some effort trying to get, you know, school kids up there to do gardening pro projects and so forth. But, but it never really took off in that respect. So, I mean, it's just something to think about in terms of, as you said, the backstory and, and the, the design elements that might, um, aside from all these structural things that that might be more um, symbolically exclusive than, than we might think about right now. Yeah. Something that can be improved, that it's not something about the project itself. But I mean, I know, first of all, okay, every day about four or five blocks on the airline because of Sorry, uh, I was saying that what you just said is something that can be improved. Uh, first of all, about me, for example, every day I walk uh, like four or six blocks on the airline because I prefer walking there, going to my office, yeah. to the office where I work. It's not mine. To the office where I work, uh, then walking on the sidewalk with cars. I prefer having some trees next to me than parked cars. Uh, second of all, uh, we want to take um, students there. It's something that can be done. We want to make the, the people living in the neighborhood participate in the uh, parking, in the park. It's something that can be done about the management, about many things. It's not something about the airline yeah. itself. This is a management yeah. problem. So uh, what, one of the chapters that is in the book uh, by uh, an author named Danya Sherman, um, is somebody who was involved in creating the public programming and outreach and community involvement program for the High Line very early on. And what we deeply appreciate about her contribution to the book is that she reflects on what they tried to do in the initial wave of public outreach, uh, public programming, and also what they learned along the process and the ways in which that can be improved. And I think that's something that we are seeing is that all the programming around the High Line is evolving from year to year. And the different kinds of groups and communities and people from across the city who are now involved artistically, creatively, educationally, um, even design and landscape-wise is, is 
constantly widening. So I do think um, it is fair to say that there is an, an arc of evolution. So yeah, um, Dania Sherman, who wrote one chapter in the book, was actually the uh, the first director of public programming for the High Line. She no for the Friends of the High Line. She no longer works for uh, the High Line, and and I think her piece is really. It's, it's very reflective, and it also uh, it focuses upon what an organization like the Friends of the High Line can do and what they cannot do. Um, some of you might be familiar that in the past year, um, Robert Hammond, one of the founders of Friends of the High Line, uh, created some controversy by saying that High Line had failed to sufficiently deal with issues of social equity, and that's part of the reason why they're creating this thing called the High Line Network, to try to inject concerns about social equity into the process of other similar Highline type projects. Um, and that was covered recently by a magazine article in Architect Magazine um, that the Highline network was going to tackle gentrification. But when we, I, I read the article today actually, and ultimately it doesn't really come up with a clear way of how we can actually tackle gentrification, which is the same questions of limitation around what groups like Friends of the High Line can do. If we're going to talk about things like tackling gentrification, we're talking about much larger transformative political projects about the redistribution of resources. We're not talking about things as simple as social inclusion of people who have traditionally been marginalized. It's actually something more transformative than inclusion. It's about, um, it, it becomes a little bit more, uh, Political, I would say, C political with a lowercase p, not a capital P. Hey, hey. Um, so I have a sort of two-part question. Um, one, we see a lot of times today that places of neglect are becoming the targets of like transnational dollars. Um, and so my question is, is looking at the High Line, um, what in terms of New York City's context are falling to the wayside? Um, as places of neglect. Um, you talked about other parks, but other than parks and, and public space, what do you um, see as places that will maybe be um, the targets of um, investment in the future? And two, do you think that um, these, uh, these projects are a part of a, a larger narrative where um, they fit into like consumption and, and they promote a certain level of social um, like, like through the built environment, they're promoting a level of social arrangement. Um, aside from the social aspect, what is the consequence of like their actual built environment um, in light of like looking at um, just hurricanes and d just the threat of just like the environment today? So there's like definitely the social threat, which is like economic, but what is the actual built, the tangible? threat of the High Line and other and efforts to restore natural ecology today? Whoa, that is a huge question. Thank you. Wow, a lot to think about there. And I think we probably need the room to come together to try to, uh, to, try to answer that. Um, I'll, I don't live in New York, so I can in no way tell you what the next hotspot for gentrification will be in the city. We don't want to tell you. Um, <laughs> but, it's being recorded. Um, <laughs> Um, but 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 the you know the, the larger question about neglect, I think is interesting. So, what makes a space neglectable historically, culturally? Why why do we forget or ignore certain spaces and then rediscover them later? And at the moment, what cities are doing is rediscovering their infrastructural history and rediscovering sites of post-industrial abandonment. But those aren't the only neglected spaces in the city. And also, I like to, you know, in these kinds of conversations, I also like to turn it back to people. So we neglect and ignore and forget spaces. We also do the same thing to people. Um, and so as we imagine how adaptive reuse or reanimating you know, abandoned spaces, um, how, how that can work going into the future, um, I think doing that with people in mind rather than property is really important. And 
this is a probably uh, a, a problematic link to make, but I'm still really struck by the hurricanes that happened in the States, both in Houston uh, as well as in Puerto Rico, and looking at the devastation to the built environment as well as to people's lives and all that kind of stuff. And if you look at Houston and we think, well, you know, what was one of the neglected spaces? It was the sprawl. It was the massive amount of concretization of surfaces, uh, which happened in plain view, but, but under the kind of radar of, of uh, um, environmental resilience and disaster recovery and all of that. So, so I think there's a more interesting question to ask here. Um, what sort of spaces should we be looking at? And I would say it's not just post-industrial, it's not just polluted and toxic, um, but maybe there, th there are parts of the city that we identify as high functioning or maybe very lucrative that are in need of reimagination. Right? It doesn't always have to be sites of poverty and misery and, 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 and darkness in terms of uh, uh, you know, just, just off the radar screen. So that's not a very helpful response, but that's, that's what I would say. W one thing I would add, um, some pitfalls of sustainability oriented planning that come up in, uh, not just in New York City, but I could use the New York City example. So we have, we don't really plan in New York City. We rezone at a site-by-site -site basis. There's no comprehensive planning process within New York. And certain areas are earmarked for rezoning, uh, quite often related to transit-oriented development, right? So increasing density, increasing, decreasing height restrictions along um, subways, for example, to um, allow for more use of public transit, less reliance on automobiles. Um, However, if you look at examples like uh, there's a lot of controversy around uh, Jerome Avenue in the Bronx right now um, about the displacement of all of the auto repair shops along the elevated subway there uh, to be replaced with market rate housing with some affordable housing, which is a problem within itself how we define affordability. Um, another example being uh, Roosevelt Avenue, the seven line going through Queens. Uh, recently, a business improvement district was defeated along Ro Roosevelt Avenue, specifically out of concerns around gentrification. And then we have Willets Point in downtown Flushing, uh, where we see, again, widespread industrial uh, displacement for market rate housing. So there's this relationship between trying to create a more sustainable city, especially through the use of transport-oriented planning, but as long as we have market-driven developments with very little uh, interference of the city into the property market, we're just going to end up with more gentrification, and it's as simple as that. Mm. Why is that? Um, so why is that? Um, Well, I think we can start off with thinking about how much influence that um, property developers have in New York City politics. Who are the primary contributors to uh, election and re-election campaigns within New York City? That's a good place to start. Um, thanks to you guys and to the uh, audience, too, for a lot of good provocative questions and points. Um, so I'm going to try to, in that vein, I'm going to try to be provocative here. and and ask um, how much of this is really new? And I guess what I would say is if you, if you take out the aesthetics, I mean, it is hard to kind of not think of this as new, the way in which we are taking um, old pieces of the old industrial landscape, abandoned things that we didn't seem to care about earlier, and now turning those into aesthetic objects and into places of consumption. And you know, on that score, I would add a couple of antecedents. I think the development of Soho is important in that regard. And even the fact that the modernists of 100 years ago loved this stuff and thought it was beautiful already. So, but if you take out the aesthetic element and you just think about the issue of developing parks, and I'm sort of drawn back to the history of Central Park a century and a half earlier. It was largely a real estate 
initiative pushed by real estate interests to open up new areas of the city for development, which it did. It displaced poor and non-white people. Um, it was never meant to engage critically with the city and its history. It was meant entirely as a kind of escape and a way, a kind of leisure way to um, experience the city without all the having to be bothered by all the problems and um, real conflicts of the city. Um, it uh, it led to a long life of conflict over the idea of a park as a work of art versus. I guess what we would consider a kind of recreation park, which I think are sort of two mm -hmm. different models. And I mean, it kind of launched a model of a, of a landscape park, which was imitated widely across the US and across the world. Um, and as I say, its whole history in some ways has been a tension. How much of this is a work of art and how much of it is a public space that's meant to be open to people? And so is it possible to extract the kind of aesthetics aside and think about, you know, are we in some ways just dealing with the latest incarnation of parks and their roles in urban development? Um, if so, are there lessons you would see from that history that might be relevant? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right that if we go back to you know Central Park and I think of a sort of Gilded Age model, but but then if you kind of move up a little bit through the you know the 60s and the 70s and you know this kind of park recreational park model that that was um, connected with a welfare state and an idea of some type of equitable distribution of resources or some kind of provision for um, ordinary citizens and working class people, then we you think of something like, like the High Line, it almost, it's a regression. So you're right, it's not necessarily something new, but it's certainly, I mean, the aesthetics are new, as you said, but, but it's certainly a regression um, and a retreat from a kind of notion of, um, of the distribution of the, uh, the largesse, the riches of the kind of society that we live in. And so I think in that sense, it's sort of, you know, it's emblematic, and, and people have talked about the living, you know, levels of inequality today are rival or maybe surpass um, the Gilded Age, and this and and this type of park development, I think, um, aesthetically and functionally, um, and in terms of the the funding mechanisms, you know, reiterates that or embodies that. So on. So that's yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a great question, um, and I both agree and disagree at the same time. So. Um, as Brian pointed out, and as you've pointed out, there are many predecessors to the High Line. And as you pointed out, in the case of, of, of the Promenade Plantée in Paris, to me that's one of the most fascinating ones, because it's the closest to the High Line that we have. And it had nothing like the effect, the transformative effect. And why is that? It's because Paris is locked down. You cannot build and change the neighborhood through which that, that site runs. And so that is a park project that is about adaptive reuse that is completely disconnected from property and development. And so it had nothing like the same effect. At the same time, the landscape through which it passes is, is fixed. It's not transforming every time you visit. It's not growing and shrinking and, and, and uh, uh, it, it, there's no dynamism. Um, in that in that landscape, but but I would actually um, push back a little bit and say that I don't think really what we're talking about here is parks. I don't think the High Line is about a park. I think the greenness of the High Line is almost accidental. I don't see it as an environmentally very sustainable space, and I don't know a lot about landscape, but people who do uh, and and people that are into botany and plants as well have you know really looked at the plantings and landscape and what's there and very little of it is local very little of it kind of makes sense for this region um, um, and it's 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 not really contributing much to the greenness and sustainability of the city and so a very different example I would mention but I do think it connects to your point is um, a site in Amsterdam where I, where, I, where I lived until recently which was an abandoned shipyard next to the, the river where the ground was so toxic and poisoned with all kinds of chemicals and heavy lead and all the stuff that comes out of those spaces, a kind of abandoned post-industrial space that was um, um, occupied by artists and architects um, who put 
old houseboats on the land, connected them with an elevated walkway, so it's a little bit like a linear park, and could connect everything, um, and created a sort of co-creative community um, to, do, to do their work. And then they added a cafe because they needed spaces to eat and socialize and talk and plan. And before you knew it, even though it was a completely sort of unplanned thing and the city was not really involved, except for letting them have the toxic land, um, it became very, very popular and it accidentally unleashed a whole mini gentrification thing in that neighborhood and then KLM or EasyJet featured it in their in-flight magazine and then within a month the place was just swamped with tourists and now there's this never-ending kind of parade of tourists walking around this walkway because you can't get off it because the land is toxic sort of clogged and perched there's no safety rails um, and 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 so to me it's another example of how a, a really grassroots movement that is about doing something positive and good at a community level can so easily and often unintentionally accidentally get transformed into something completely different and it's how do we avoid that 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 last step of transformation when it no longer belongs to that community and that's what we're seeing all over the place and the high line just happens to be a park but there are many many examples of that one thing that I might say is a little bit new about Highline and similar projects is we're looking specifically at um, spaces of urban infrastructure. Um, they, they are the subject of a lot of fascination within the design fields. We can ask ourselves why. Um, we, you know, we have this school of thought within landscape architecture called landscape urbanism, which is trying to scale landscape architecture upwards towards the scale of the city through infrastructure. So James Corner Field Operations, one of the main designers of the High Line, is very associated with landscape urbanism. We had, you know, this whole entire trend of the adaptive reuse of industrial structures, you know, going back to Soho over half a century ago. I think that the adaptive reuse of infrastructural spaces is essentially the next step in that sort of process. And what makes it different from other types of more traditional parks is the sort of fact that we're talking about linearity, we're talking about leftover spaces, we're not talking about carving out a new big part of the city, we're talking about inserting into the, or the, the you know, very stubborn fabric of the city. You don't just displace these sort of linear infrastructures. They have their own sort of paths and they have their own leftovers. The areas surrounding them for a long time had been neglected and with low property values. Now that there's sufficient property development pressure that these sites actually might have some value, that's the point in which we see them as this new opportunity for design practice. So I think that it's the infrastructural nature of these spaces that really is the new thing and obviously a number of overlapping trends which have already been in existence. I have a question. Um, I'm really interested in, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the High Bridge, which is up on 177th Street or something. Um, it was a, an aqueduct that was built around uh, the Civil War. And when it was originally built, it was like a public walk space. And it eventually sort of fell into disrepair and they closed it off to pedestrians. And then recently they renovated it and now it's open to pedestrians. And it's up in Washington Heights and I, I'm sort of fascinated by it in that it doesn't seem like it's, at least to, from what I've seen, it hasn't brought any ch big changes to the neighborhood. I haven't seen any like uh, development, real estate development or changes in the businesses, um, especially on the Bronx side. I was just curious like what you thought about that, how that relates maybe to the High Line and the effects that it's had, um, and is it because of the location? Is it because of uh, transportation issues? I, I'm just curious what you think. Well, uh, the, I mean, a, as, I'm sorry, what's your name? Yeah, Gary. Valerio. Valerio, as Valerio pointed out, um, it was happening in 
West Chelsea before the High Line was developed. I mean, and and very much spurred, among other things, by the the burgeoning gallery district and and the area having become not only on the northern northwest part of a um, an art hub, but then further south in the Meatpacking District, a kind of a fashion um, a fashion hub. And I think in around the High Bridge th that you know, those factors are not in place, but, but I think um, property value is going up in, um, in the Bronx and in Washington Heights. I mean, certainly, it, you know, it's becoming less and less affordable to the kinds of residents who were there before, so it may not be, uh, you know, this kind of sudden infusion of um, glitz and glamour, but I think you'll find in the long run that, that it, it does end up functioning as part part of a lot larger picture of development there. That's just my hunch. But. Yeah, and I guess it also raises the question of, uh, and you kind of mentioned this before, Brian. You know, t green enough. So um, um, you know, staying enough under the radar not to get the attention and the hype that has accompanied projects like the High Line, and uh, uh, maybe that's one of the things to learn for other cities who are looking at these kinds of sites is, you know, sometimes not being a focal point of attention is okay. Um, I'm conscious of time. Should we just take one last question? And then, am I, did, I, did I see light uh, catering out there somewhere? Is that true? Yeah, I there is. I'll announce that. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So, so we'll be so able yeah, to we'll talk over nibbles in a, in a moment. Let's take one last question. Then we can wrap up. Um, one specific question. When were you in Nord? Amsterdam Nord? Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I lived in Amsterdam for 10 years. I mean, like, when, because I, I, I've been there, I, well, I stayed there yeah. two years ago, um, and it wasn't overrun. I was just wondering when you experienced Oh, Amsterdam Nord is, is, is getting overrun. <coughs> so it's, it's a large, <coughs> Amsterdam Nord is the, the former kind of industrial zone of Amsterdam to the north of the city and also the, the historical working class neighborhood of, of the city. Um, and it's quite spread out and unevenly developed. But if you go to en areas like NDSM Wharf, where it has a big um, um, uh, wharf that's turned into an artist colony, and then MTV put their offices, and they opened a hipster hotel called Brooklyn Hotel. Um, <laughs> And then Guinness put their headquarters, or they their put a you know, big office complex in there. Um, that's one part. But over by Bauk Slauterham, if you know that area, yeah. um, the property market there is just really out of control. And it's because of the um, de Curvel, which is the uh, um, um, toxic space that, uh, that I mentioned. It's because of projects like de Curvel, which are bringing artists and creative industries people and designers to Amsterdam Nord, and relative to the rest of the city, it's still, it's still somewhat affordable. And because the rest of Amsterdam is now completely unaffordable, I sold my house last year in half an hour. Um, it was crazy. Um, um, people who live and work in Amsterdam are, are, everybody's moving to the north. That is, that is the new, it's the, it's the Brooklyn of Amsterdam. Oh, um. I don't know if we have time for it. I just wanted to know what your definitions of public space were. <laughs> okay, I thought, <laughs> who wants to take that one? Yeah, quick fire answers, please. <laughs> I, I have an anecdote about public space which might partially answer your question. So I did a project with some students in, uh, in a zone of Rome a while back about the temporary reappropriation of urban spaces. And I was having a conversation with the, this was maybe eight years ago, uh, Tor Pignatara. Uh, and I had a conversation with the Italian students about well, great, which of this land is public and which of this land is private. And what, so ultimately what came out of this conversation is the notions of public and private space are very much defined by particular uh, legal traditions, uh, particular even cultures. And it was largely presumed that if an area wasn't very clearly delineated as private, it was essentially treated as if it was public. I think we see uh, in, in Spain, it's, it's largely the, the same way. 
So I think public space, it means one thing in terms of design discourses, how I might say that public space needs to be publicly owned, but that does not tend to be the case in most new quote unquote public spaces that are being created now. So um, there is no actual answer to what really constitutes public space. It might be about access, it might be about ownership, it might be who is and is not uh, allowed to be there, and it might be about who is excluded. There's, there's so many different ways to think about it. I mean, there's a lot of work now. I think a lot of scholars in geography, urban studies, anthropology, sociology are, are really engaging with this question. What is, what is public space in today's world, in today's cities? Um, and I, I, I would, I mean, I like your answer, Brian, and I think there, there are legal classifications, but setting that aside, for me, what's really important about public space are the kinds of activities and behaviors that are, that are uh, allowed there. That are, well, it shouldn't even be a question of allowed, that are, that are possible there. What I think is very interesting about contemporary urban public spaces is just how much they are now surveilled and securitized. Um, and how all of our activities, including our, our, our data and, and everything about us, is being monitored and checked. And um, I, I think there's something kind of creepy almost and paranoid about public space now. I don't trust it anymore. <laughs> So, no answer? I, well, I could, but I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Fine. In the interest of time, I won't. <laughs> okay, so, thanks everybody for your participation. Thanks, Christoph, Julia, and Brian for your contributions.